you. So I'm showing my screen and I have my microphone on and we're going to go into the slides again. All right, so we talked a little bit about what we are going to cover and now I'm going to talk about what we're not going to cover. So data science does not exist on its own. Like as much as you may like it, it is dependent on upstream and downstream processes. So your products um, may be in your head and they're working on your Jupyter Notebook, but hopefully at some point they go somewhere. Oh, okay. So typically, um, you're going to ship your results to someone else, and they're going to be inflicted with the code that you wrote and the visualizations that you have, and they're going to have to use those. So it's often useful to think about where is your code going? Because in this class, for instance, your code is not just things that you write for your own entertainment. You're probably going to be submitting it to me for a grade, right? So like, try and think about, does Ben want to see this code? I don't know. Like, maybe, maybe you want to think about that a little bit. All right. So typically, data science starts towards the, the beginning of a process where like, you get some data, you have to apply some transformations to it, you have to understand what's in your data, what the problems are, whether you want to keep using it, and then someone might build a product around it. Right. So like, typically, you're not a software engineer. I accept that. Like, you're going to write code as a data scientist who doesn't have a training and background in software. That's cool. That's why I'm here to teach you. Right. But you prepare up. You, if you're lucky, right, the thing that you write will be handed to someone else to make into a product that then gets sold and makes profit for a company. That's typically the way things work in the world. So that means that you're going to be giving something to someone else, and then they're going to have to go support it, right? Because it's not just the development of a product, it's also the long-term support. That's typically like five to ten years, right, depending on the field you're in. Um, and that's a long time to support something that you didn't invent or write. Right? So the ownership of a product is typically not with the team that supports it. It's with the data scientists who came up with the, the cool thing, right? So that's, that sort of disconnect causes some problems. We'll talk about that later in class. Right, so I'm not going to focus on those people that you're inflicting your code upon, but it's worth thinking about. Um, someone mentioned security. I was sort of like striving away from that because we will not focus on security in this class. We will talk about privacy. But security is more about like making sure that hackers can't hack into your things, right, or your network or stuff like that. That's typically not where data scientists um, worry and spend their most of their concern. There are data scientists who work in the security field, but that's a, a, a very small subset. So most of data science isn't concerned with like products, and therefore it's not exposed to the hackers who are trying to attack the product. And so you're typically not having to deal with it unless you work in security for data science. All right, so now we've talked a lot about uh, like overview stuff. So I don't have any questions on the content we've covered so far. Mm, someone should have, someone has their, <laughs> right. <laughs> Just mute your uh, speakers. All right, so now we're going to go off into a little bit of technical area. So, <laughs> <laughs> do you have uh, mic uh, speakers on? You want to mute your speakers. All right. So I'm going to go over what I call file formats. These are like data formats that maybe you've seen, maybe you have. That's cool. Um, and so I'm going to talk about these three primarily: CSVs, JSON, and XMLs. Um, those are file formats. Excel is sort of like a subset of CSV. You'll see how that works out in a minute. Those aren't the only data structures that we have in this class. We also think about images and sound and video. Not so much in Data 601, right? But we will get to those a little bit. So there are um, some links there, obviously, with the CSV, JSON, and XML, so you can read about those. The reason that those are attractive to us is because we're poor students and we can't afford to pay a bunch of extra software money. And these are all free and open source and somewhat defined. So. If you write software that leverages these formats, it means other people can go use those formats and not have to pay a bunch of money for it. And if you've used MATLAB or Mathematica or other proprietary software or Excel, right, these are formats where in order to even open that data file, you often have to pay for software. Mm -hmm. And the consequence of that is that you're now making your stuff inaccessible to a large portion of the world's population. Right? So that's so 
there's sort of like a moral argument for why free software is important. Right? So free software enables accessibility of your results and your data and your analysis. Um, and also, I mean, like, this is like a cool thing to think about, right? The Library of Congress recommends JSON, CSV, and XML. Those are formats that the Library of Con Congress expects to be sustainable and portable over the many decades that we'll have digital data. Right? So like, <laughs> the Library of Congress does not recommend Excel because Excel goes under revisions as often as Microsoft wants to release a product. So that's something that was sort of like, again, sustainability, durability, those are important things if you're in the long-term game. We'll also talk about two other things um, a little bit later in class. All right, as I alluded to, the text structure um, that we're talking about isn't the only thing um, that's in data science. There's also unstructured text. So these are things like essays that you write. You know, these are things that don't have, they have like grammar and things, but computers aren't really good at grammar. Oh, well. There's also images and sound and video. To me, these are just like giant um, matrices of ones and zeros that you can manipulate. So they're not like text, um, but there are things that we care about in data science about those formats. All right, so now we're gonna focus on one little thing, a table. And I do not mean a table like you're sitting at. Um, so think of a table as like a two-dimensional data structure, right? typically with rows and columns, and I'm gonna ask you a question that is underspecified. I have this habit in class of always asking underspecified questions. It's not just because I'm an asshole. It's also because I want you to think about the problem without me telling you what to think about. So that's, that's the, the balance I'm trying to strike there is like, I want you to think about how would you represent grades in this course in a table format, but I can't tell you too much more than that. So they don't have something like a riff off the top of their head, like what, what's the first thing that comes to mind as a, a design? Mm -hmm. Along the bottom, all your x-axis and percentage completion on the y-axis. Right. I'm running out of room here, because I want to say something. You said students on x -axis. versus grades. Grades. So percentage and we also have an alternative design. Yeah, we also have time and thousand grades. I think that's mostly that you put so many grades. So, so what was the uh, assignments? Well, we can make one for assignments, one for projects, something like that. We can segregate them. Multiple tables. Yeah, multiple tables. Oh, all right. They have like uh, projects. A, yeah. All right. They don't have a third design. Well, I thought we have charts, like bar charts or something that so, way. So those I would call visualizations. Mm -hmm. So for this exercise, we're just focused on the um, table, the data actually itself. We have one. Like we have uh, assignments, data divided for each assignment, then project. So we can have separate columns for. Ah, columns, okay. Yeah. All right. And and then yeah. So, so I was intentionally sort of provoking you into the fact that there are multiple ways of arranging data into a table, right? That's, that's like somewhat obvious, but then you realize Wait, that means anyone can represent data however they want, and it's all equivalent. Usually, like it gets to be a mess, right? So, like, this is just an example of like this isn't the answer. This is one of the potential solutions if you, you had this data, right? So, like, last name, first name, grades. Right? That was mentioned. So it's not really surprising. There's not like an infinite number of these, but there's not one either, and that's also messy. All right. So you've probably seen things like this, right? We've already mentioned Excel. We've seen, um, like on Wikipedia, tables of things, right? So like, these aren't new data structures to you. It's just the fact that I'm calling them a data structure might be a new concept. Um, so tables are a thing that you've definitely seen before. I, I'm confident. All right, and I'll just reemphasize, you're probably gonna go off onto the internet and find um, Excel documents that have data in them, that's cool. They are tables of data. I will have projects focused around that concept, um, but we're not gonna do our analysis in Excel for these reasons, right? And so we will, in this class, learn how to use ex data from Excel in Python. But and maybe that blows your mind, right? You've thought of Excel as a way of like clicking on buttons and typing things in, in cells. We're gonna do that from a programming language. Right? So your computer will manipulate your Excel file for you, which is way more powerful. All right. 
So now I'm going to ask you a harder question now that you understand the uh, question. When, when you mentioned about the Excel is fragile, like what do you mean by that? So, so that was the concept that I was referring to earlier where you have like the first piece of data that you enter into an Excel file is very easy, right? Because there's nothing else to sort of screw it up. But maybe like after five years of entering data into a single Excel spreadsheet with like lots of modifications and like dependencies, like with this cell depends on this cell, but you can't see that anywhere. Right? So that's what I mean by fragile is that the more data that you're putting into it over a long time span, the harder it gets. That shouldn't be the case for what we're doing in this class. Like things shouldn't be fragile because it means they won't scale. Right, so now that you understand sort of the game we're playing with tables and stuff like that, I have a harder question, right? So a corpus is basically a collection like a, of data, and here we have a collection of emails. So I, the people who have already answered, I want to get people who have not answered yet to respond to this question, how would I design a table for a collection of emails? Subject what? Subject like, like yeah. in column, uh, uh, particular subjects again, put it in one column and then data in the. What's the data? Uh, the emails, um, the content of the text. The, okay, the body? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? What else would you want to include in a date? Date. Date. By the size of the email. The size, okay. Someone else? Extension. Extension on what? Uh, dot, um, dot. Uh, the, so the sender's domain. Right. So now you're sort of thinking about what columns would you want to design in a table that holds information about emails. Awesome. So again, I'm not going to provide you an answer. I'm just going to provide you like this is a thing that maybe you would have in a table. So typically, we don't work with emails as a table of data. <laughs> But um, hopefully through exercises in this class, you'll sort of learn that it is super useful to sort of take this comp format of data and put it into a table and then apply manipulations to it. All right. So now that we've seen sort of like a motivating use cases, now we'll dive into like what are the nuances of how we do this. So a CSV um, just stands for a comma separated file, comma separated value, sorry. Um, and then basically the main uh, that's really unfortunate. So it doesn't get on my screen. If you're following along in Blackboard, you should be able to see the slides. Yeah? Okay. So that's one advantage to following along in Blackboard. So basically, this was a, a picture of rows right, and columns, that the columns are washed out. And typically, you'll see something like this, right? So a bunch of names and some values and countries and quarters and that's where like the domain expertise comes in, right? Subject matter expertise of like, what does all this mean, right? And hopefully it means something to someone and you're solving a problem. All right, so now a little bit about the jargon, right? So the, the main word that you'll really become comfortable with is a delimiter. This is a thing that separates your columns. So in this case, we have the delimiter of a comma separating this first column from the second column. And then the rows are separated by line breaks, right? So like every new line is a new row. That's not always true, by the way. And headers. So this is the thing that makes CSV is like a, a real joy to work with is that usually, and the keyword being usually, there's a first row that describes what those columns are. So if you don't have a header in your CSV, it's sort of like a detective game you get to play and say like, what do I think the data is? <laughs> So, and then the other sort of like caveat is sometimes that row, uh, the header is just one row. Then it's probably typically pretty easy to work with and you're not like scared. But sometimes like you have multi row headers and then like it gets real messy. So if you can think about it, then somebody has done it. And if you haven't thought about it, it's done it. Like CSVs are the worst nightmare of a data scientist, right? Because they're just so easy to screw up. And we'll definitely get into that in the next few slides. All right, so some things that CSVs are not good for, right, they're intended for text. So you typically don't see images in a CSV, right, because they're just text. Um, and then sort of you assume, and you'll notice this is an assumption, that everything in this column is of the same type, right? <laughs> It'd be like super obvious, but why would you mix types in a column? Well, 
do that. So, um, and all these columns, like these are the same things, like they're dollars and they have commas and they have dollar signs and numbers and stuff. Yeah, so good things to think about. Now there's some complexities, right? So here, this dollar value here has a comma in it. That doesn't mean it was a new column, or sorry, uh, yeah, new column. It means that these double quotes here are saying to the CSV reader, hey, treat this as a thing. Right. So then we get into these uh, double quotes, but what if your column entry had a quote in it, right? Like I wanted to report the value 24 inches. Well, that wrap that with, right? And this whole, it just goes off the rails very quickly. So like I said, CSVs get super dangerous and most of the time they work and some of the times they don't. So to deal with this complexity, people have come up with workarounds, which makes your life even harder to deal with them, right? <laughs> and so here's an example. So in our last section, we had uh, values with commas in them, and the solution was to wrap them in double quotes, so you know that that was a thing, an entry. Another solution is, well, you could put uh, pipes as your delimiter, and that would solve your problem, as long as your text doesn't have pipes in it. You see where this is going? Like, yeah. Every time there's a little variation, now you have to come up with a workaround, and that's where things go crazy. All right, so that's a little easy example for us. All right, the last sort of like thing I want to like boggle your mind with is fixed width format. So if you haven't seen it, it don't feel bad if you haven't seen this before because it's not usually comes up for normal people. It like, comes up for data scientists. So um, can anyone sort of like explain why fixed width format just by staring at it might be useful? Indexes? What do you mean by that? Yeah, but yes. So that's that is the premise of fixed width format. But why would we want to do that, sir? That is also a true statement. But all the other ones also cool. I'll give you one more guess. And there are spaces in the. Yes, that that. But a delimiter is typically not a space, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, like, like, the, the, the reason, the motive typically to use fixed width format is if you think um, that size is important and you want to really consolidate things, right? Because remember back with these other formats, we had to use a delimiter. And delimiters introduce problems because sometimes our text has the delimiter character in it and you have to deal with that. So the advantage here is you're saving some space and you don't have to worry about a delimiter at all, right? As long as you say like, this column is 32 characters wide, therefore, don't worry about what the delimiter is. You just count 32 characters, like you said, and then move on to the next column. Right? So there's no delimiters to worry about, and you're saving space. Mm -hmm. right? So that's, and. But then don't you have issues with like trailing or leading spaces to deal with? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> there's no good solution. So the challenge here is like making the architectural decision of what is the maximum width of a data entry that I will ever see. Right? That's a tough choice to make. It's the same choice as like what delimiter should I use, right? <laughs> All right, I have some like head nodding from Ravi. Thank you. That's that's like the oh my god, like, this is stupid, right? <laughs> All right. Well, if you think this is bad, just wait. All right. So now we've seen uh, fixed width, we've seen delimiters, we've seen commas, right? All these good things for dealing with problems. Time for a quiz. All right. So I'm gonna go into Blackboard and we're gonna use uh, quizzing in Blackboard. So uh, I do have some backup cards, but I don't think we'll have to use them. All right, so this is your data set. You are a CSV parser. You're gonna read this data in, all right? So the question is, and don't shout out the answer, does this have a header? So let's see if I can switch over to Blackboard. Uh, pull in. All right, so this is as much an exercise in using Blackboard as it is uh, uh, the actual quiz, right? So this is your data. This would have a header. And we'll see what the quiz says. So we've got seven yeses so far. Good job. So yes, it has a header. All right, so that should be pretty straightforward. Now I'll go on to the next one. So how many rows does this have? And I think I'm going to go one more. So Bowen. Yeah. 
Yes. So are, are you? So you have to be in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Yep. Uh, other BB tools. And then in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. This one. And then join the session once it pops up. I'll make our. So right, this is a technology quiz, basically. So, so yeah, you go in through your course. Other mm -hmm. yeah. uh, You're going to click on this session that's going on in progress. Yep, open that folder. Join this session. Uh, join this session. Yep, open that folder. Join this session. Uh, other new tools, apply for cyber culture. And then that once that opens up, run the folder. The session in progress. And so, okay. Yep. Uh, so join the session. Just uh, learn. Awesome. All right. Anyone else not in the session? Most people are in the quiz. Um, so please vote on the quiz and I will pull up the data again. All right. So the question is, how many rows are in the CSV? All right, so we'll come back to the quiz. So we've got a bunch of choices for four, some for five. Let's see what we've got. So this is a sort of a tricky, right? Sort of like Ben special here. So we've got five rows and four columns. So if you went with a four, don't feel bad. The header is a row. Just a little nuance there. All right. So as soon as you guys start using uh, the tool for this class, Python and Pandas, you're going to come back to me and complain, that quiz was misleading. And I'll say, yes, it was. So the reason you're going to complain is because when you read in that CSV in Pandas, which is a Python library, and ask Pandas how many rows are there, it only reports the number of rows of data. So it skips the header in that row count. That's a little nuanced thing to vote. All right, so I've mentioned some words already. So Pandas, that's a library in Python. And we'll be using a data structure called data frames. We'll cover those more in the future classes. And so these are just some links you started so when you review these slides, you can say, what has Ben talking about? None of this makes sense. Yes, we will cover it in class. OK. So now I'm going to show you Jupyter Notebooks. Woohoo! Live demos. All right. So I'm going to open up my Jupyter Notebook and show you what's going on. All right. So what I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you a quick demo. How are we doing on time? So I'm going to give you a quick demo of using Python and Jupyter. So this will probably confuse you because you don't know which one's Python and which one's Jupyter. Okay, so the, just for a heads up, the things in this color text, that's what I'm typing, that's the Python part. The fact that you have a web interface and all this fancy formatting and output, that's Jupyter. So you won't pick that up immediately, and it will become uh, hopefully uh, recurrent. So I'm going to edit and can do that. All right, so I'm just going to rerun all the cells quick. All right, so the I'm taking my notebook <laughs> and I'm saying execute every single cell that is having code in it. And so it's running Python 3 and it executes this little snippet of code. So this is code that I wrote. And I have a CSV in the directory I'm working in. And I'll show you what that CSV looks like. 
it will look just like this. Right? And this is the output of the CSV content because I printed that content in the file. So basically we're opening the file as a read on uh, as a read and then we're labeling it with this variable name. And we're gonna take every line in the file and we're gonna loop over that and print every line. If you don't know what with, with statements are, or for loops, or print statements, we will be learning how to program in this class. So not everyone is an expert programmer. If you are a uh, like well-trained, experienced software engineer with 10 years of experience in the real world, I apologize, it's going to be a little slow to get started. But this gets back to that ramp up of complexity. Right? So we're going to have to get everybody on the same page. That'll take a little bit of time. We'll just have to sit through that if you're experienced. All right. So I just showed you some real simple code to read CSV. Let's see what that CSV looks like. All right, so this is the CSV format um, rendered in Python. It's this, uh, sorry, in uh, Jupyter, it's the same thing as what we looked at when we printed it. So nothing too surprising. But it's just to say the file exists outside of the notebook, and we're analyzing that file content. Okay, so this looks cool. We're like, woohoo! We read a CSV, right? This is a really bad idea. Don't do this. <laughs> the reason is because we assumed that the CSV was nice and pretty and you know had all the assumptions that were correct, that there are lines, right? And so I'm going to show you like we've just read every line. That's all we've done so far. So if you went a little bit further, you could take the line that you were printing and before you printed it, split on the commas. Right, so again, very naively right thing to do. You just take a CSV, assume that it's broken on the lines, and then you split the CSV by commas. Then you get back Python, when it prints that, it says, oh, now this is a list of things. So every line is a list of elements. So we're like, woohoo, we parsed the CSV and made list of every line. Like, what could possibly go wrong, right? Well, when your CSV doesn't adhere to those assumptions that we're making, it would break. Like you'll notice here, for instance, um, the CSV had a trailing line break on the last line, and so when Python went to read that, Python's like, well, your last line just has no text in it. That's not actually what's, what you intended, right? but it's what the file contained, and it's how you parsed the content. So we've already encountered a problem. There's not really any problems with the CSV. So what's the better way to do that? I was mentioning earlier, and I'll mention this over and over, other people write code and they make it available to you so that you can use it. There's a trade-off. Do I the code myself and get it done quickly and possibly wrong? Or do I search, do I spend time searching for other people's code and do I use the code they've written that's probably more complicated but handles all the edge cases I don't typically worry about? And that's the trade-off. So I can't tell you what the right thing to do is. It definitely depends on the situation you're in, the problem you're solving, how well you've decomposed it, how well you know these other libraries. <coughs> okay, so in this case, I've imported someone else's code. They've called it CSV. That's the name of the library. Super easy to remember. Okay. That's cool. Um, and then we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to open up the file. We're going to read it into a variable name. But now we're going to do something different. We're going to use the CSV library, which has this function called reader. And we're going to pass it the variable that has the content in it. And then we're going to give it an instruction. And you're like, Ben, how would I possibly know all this complicated things about a library that I just called in? This is the part where you get to read documentation about code. Woohoo! Everybody likes doing that, right? <laughs> Nobody likes doing that, right? So this is the hard and painful part. You're going to use someone else's code. You have to figure out how it is that they operate on the data that you're going to pass them and what do they hand you back. It's complicated. So there's no way around it. Like, you just have to read uh, the documentation about what it is they provide and what their expectations are so you can conform to that and use their code. Okay, so now we've, we've used their library and they have a function in it that reads their file and then gives something back and it puts it in a variable. That's a very typical type of programming approach. You have a thing that takes a thing in and then produces a thing. That whole concept is called a function. Right? So a function operates on input variables and produces output variables, just like in math. All right, now that you've got the reader variable, which contains the content, hopefully, again, you want to loop over the content and then just print the elements. 
And you're like, Ben, how would I know that this variable contains a list? Anybody have an answer for that? Hmm? Associated with it. No, so I, I have this this library which has a function and it produced a thing that I'm putting in a variable. But how would I know that that's a variable that's a list? You have to read the documentation. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. I mean, that's how you know, right? So there are other ways, but um, so this is a list, and then you're just looping over elements in that list and you're printing them. And look at what you get back. You get this parsed set of values back from your CSV. So that's sort of equivalent to the work that we did up here, but it hid a couple of things, right? So like, for instance, you have this trailing space here, right, or the, sorry, the leading space. So we have this special instruction here where it said skip initial space equals true. So now we see that this character here doesn't have a leading space. That's like a thing that the person who wrote this library said, wow, that happens so often, we should make that available to people who are using our software. Right, because then you don't, you as the user don't have to do that on your own. So it's, again, back to that trade-off of they're providing some functionality. There's a barrier that you have to learn how to use it. But then typically if the thing gets used over and over, it's in a library somewhere. All right. So we're probably approaching a lot of complexity that people are feeling a little overwhelmed with. That's normal. Like, <laughs> this is just a little first preview because you're going to go off, you're going to have these notebooks in Blackboard that you can go and run them on your own. So um, this is just me talking through them a little bit. And I want to break you in gently to the idea of using pandas. Pandas is a super powerful library in Python for handling table structures. So here, I'm going to do the same exact sort of reading of CSVs, but I'm going to import a library called pandas. Same concept. I have a library which has a function which I pass a name to. So here's the name of the CSV. I get a thing back, that's my variable that contains the content. And then when I print that, it just shows me the content of the CSV. I uh, notice it looks a lot different. Right? It's not a list. It's not parsing the strings. It has all these like numbers running down the side. Those are indexes. And then it has like the column headers in this bold format, right? So it even looks pretty. So this is again back to the content, to the idea that um, someone did a bunch of work and you're leveraging their work so that you can be more productive. Okay, and it, you didn't even have to tell it to drop the spaces, right? So like, it just like knows that those are strings, take off the leading space, it's all good. Okay, and then as I mentioned, back to the quiz that we were taking, um, Pandas reports that this is a four by four um, CSV, so it doesn't count the headers. Yeah, and then just to say like, we can go off and do this whole game over again for delimiters. And, you know, I'm not going to stop up your time here, but that whole thing exists, and you can do a bunch of things with it. So again, all of these will be uh, available on Blackboard, these notebooks, and so you can go off and play with them on your own. Questions on the notebook before we leave? Okay. Stunned to silence. It's my favorite talk. Mm -hmm. All right. So now that you're CSV experts, we have a a question that I'm going to ask someone who has not contributed yet what the answer is. So if you've already, I, I have not memorized all your names and faces yet, so I'm going to rely on your utmost faith and confidence and trust that you actually just have an answer yet. All right, so take a look at this. Tell me why this would break. I'm sorry, I think it's different. Yep, so thank you for asking. This is the CSV. Mm -hmm. It has some problems. What problems does that CSV have? So the first uh, row has yeah. Yeah. Five, uh, five rates. OK, what, where five specifically is the problem? Uh, Porter Junior. Porter Junior. That's, that's the issue there. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else who has not yet contributed? Down here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. And then ID, second one, having seven. Uh, the number of entries you're saying? Uh, that wouldn't be a problem necessarily, it's just an inconsistency in the number of digits, but it's a reasonable statement. So the things that I was looking for was that um, if you wanted to do this correctly, you probably want to put like quotes around things that have commas in them. That's how the CSV parser is going to say that, oh, that's, a, that's an entry. Okay. So, We've sort of like led you down the path of like 
there are things that are wrong and will break your CSV parser. There are other mistakes that your CSV parser will have no problem with, but are inconsistent. So these are like layers of problems, right? So, so as an example, if I had a CSV with inconsistent types, it might look like this, right? So the first row would be Bob 52 and what looks like a phone number, and the second row could have also three entries separated by commas. Mm -hmm. So, so far, CSV parsing is good. But then you're like, what are these columns, right? These columns do not make any sense. Mm -hmm. And you start to question, is this even a CSV? Like, it just has commas in text, right? So, like, the problem with CSVs is there's no way to enforce this consistency. Like, you can't say all of column one is text, all of column two is a number, right? All of column three is a phone number. Like, that's just not part of the CSV standard. So it's up. So the responsibility then lies with the peer person or people writing the CSV to think ahead about how someone's going to read this. There's no requirement that that person's responsible. So you typically in the wild see CSVs that are just horrendous. Like my favorite, it always shows up. Someone thinks I'm just going to put this paragraph of text as a CSV entry. Anyone sort of like as a as an entry in a row, right? Not thinking ahead of like, oh, a paragraph that has line breaks in it. How will the CSV handle text with line breaks in it? That's crazy talk. That's totally normal also, I mean, but it's crazy. <laughs> so this is sort of the, the joy and experience that you're looking forward to as a data scientist. That's like ran your brain. <laughs> if you get like a reverse pleasure from all this, you're definitely in the right field. <laughs> all right, so uh, I think we'll take a little bit of a break and then come back to uh, two additional data formats um, called JSON and XML. So let's take a break, come back at 8.45, and we'll resume.
Okay, so I think we have everybody back. Okay. All right, so as I mentioned, we're going to talk about two other data structures this evening, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, some non technical aspects of data science. So I'm going to introduce some concepts that you probably are not that familiar with if you have not programmed before. And that's okay. We'll be revisiting them multiple times over the semester, but just think of this as your first exposure to the concepts. So the, the first idea is the key value concept. This will show up repeatedly in Python, so it's worth being familiar with. Um, XML relies on tags, elements, and attributes. Not so much a focus in this class, but in the interest of me trying to be comprehensive, um, 
I need to at least expose you to the idea of XML. And we will have some homework centered around XML, so it's not just going to be in this slide. All right, so if you haven't seen JSON before, uh, it covers JavaScript object notation, but it is not related to JavaScript. It's a historical issue. The idea here is that you have a bunch of text, and it doesn't look like a CSV. So the, the concept that it sort of like is based on, unfortunately, this is out of whack. All right. So there's this ID in a string, and then separated by a colon, and then another string. So I'll get the text box out of the way there. But basically, you have a, a key and a value. And those are the, the basic components. And so here, they're separated by a colon, and they're wrapped in uh, double quotes. A more complicated structure, and this is just not looking too good. I'm gonna see, there we go. All right, that looks better. So here we have a key, which is menu item, wrapped in double quotes, and then there's a colon, and the value is a list. So that's the complexity here. So, and this list is denoted with this uh, square bracket, and what does the list contain? A bunch of key value pairs. Right, so here we have this represents sort of a beginning of a dictionary. So there's a key and a value, and another key and another value. And then there's another one of these things, dictionary of key value, key value. All right. So now it's sort of like pop quiz time. Who knows how many key value pairs there are in this dictionary? So uh, shout it out when you have an answer. I'm not going to wait for everybody on this one. Do we have one answer of six? Anyone else have a competing answer? No, 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 in the entire JSON file. Okay. Um, okay. So I think the consensus here is the 11. I'll pop out of here. Yeah, I don't know why that's not happening. There we go. All right, so all the things that are to the left of a semicolon are keys, and on the right side is the value. So that's sort of the way to count that. Not that you'll ever need to count keys in a JSON file. It's just sort of an exercise to see if you understand the concept. OK. So that was all I wanted to show you on that. Then we'll pop out of the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, sorry, pop out of this into Jupyter Notebook. All right. So you're going to sense a recurring theme here. Right? The theme is we load a library that does a complicated thing for us so that we don't have to write a JSON parser. Because writing a JSON parser would be a long bit of code that we don't want to write. So we're going to import two libraries. One is called JSON. It's very intuitively named, right? This is a really big You can also notice the theme that libraries try to convey the things they're working on. So, um, and then tprint stands for pretty print. And so typically, um, if we have some JSON code, and again, this is to emphasize this is a Python piece of code, and this is a thing that I'm using in Jupyter to describe what the text is doing or what the code is doing. So I'm going to execute that cell. Uh, and this time I worked ahead a little bit. So here you have these square brackets next to a colon, and they're empty. In Jupyter, that means that this code hasn't been executed yet. And you can't see it. Oh, man. This is, I'm going to have to work on the screen thing. But basically, it turns. You can't see, but this turns into a star and then turns into a number. But we'll skip all that for now. So basically, I executed this bit of code here, and it produced this output. So the purpose here, and we'll just not spend too much time, but you've got a library. It has a function. It takes a thing. The thing I'm posting that I'm putting in that function is the handle to my file. So it's going to open this file as a read. Again, I can show the JSON in my folder, but it's not very exciting because it just looks like this. The output of that function was a variable, and I'm taking that variable and I'm passing it to that print, the pretty print library, and say, print my JSON for me. All right. So then, once you have that data structure, you can access elements. In so that key value thing that we were talking about before, I have the variable, and I want to see what's in the entry where it says the key is menu. Sorry? Oh, yeah, R. Yeah, so this is the file name, and we're opening it in read. Yeah, so we're reading from, as opposed to W for write. Right, so now if I look at 
what is the output of this variable, menu data, where the key is menu. That's just everything that's on the right hand side of that semicolon in this. All right. That's all we got. So now, now it gets a little messy. So now I say, how do we navigate our way down into this data structure? Like menu, ID, on click. How do I get there, right? How do I access this variable? This is another programming concept that we'll learn, nesting. So we have a dictionary that contains a key value pair. One of the values is another dictionary, so I want to access that. All right, so here, what I have is a variable with a key, and then a key within that value. So I can now access this part. You can sort of see where that's going. All right, so now I can access elements in the list by giving it an index. So the zeroth element of a list, we're counting a list from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Again, welcome to programming. We do things differently here. Rather than counting as 2, 3, 4, we count from 0. So we're accessing that list. The zeroth element of the list is the first thing you see. Not to confuse you, but it's confusing. OK. So now I think I'm going to cause myself a problem. So I'm going to ask. What is the value associated with the key pop-up? And you know it's in the data, like you saw it in the JSON file. But when you ask the variable that, the variable's like, I don't have a, a key named pop-up. And you're like, what? What's going on here? Because right. if you remember, that on top here, so when I printed the contents of the file, I very clearly see that there was a pop-up key. The reason that we can't access that is because the only key av uh, available to the variable is that first one, menu. So here, we did get it to work because it's a sub-nested um, key there. So this is also a good excuse to talk about errors. So when I ran uh, this code in Python, I got back this message from Jupyter saying, you tried to do a Python thing, and it broke. So we'll talk about that in future classes, but basically, this is trying to tell you what broke and potentially where to fix it, right? And it even tells you what kind of error. So it says, like, hey, in this line of code that I was executing, I ran into a problem. I don't know actually how to solve your problem, but at least the type of the problem that I ran into is called a key error. So that's going to help you debug what's going on there. So we had a, a variable with a key and some subkeys, and when we referenced the key that didn't exist, we got back a key error. So hopefully that's a little bit understandable, but it's going to be a lot of work for you to get to learn that if you haven't seen it before. So then this last trick here is, if I have a variable and I know somehow that it's a dictionary, how would I know what keys are available in that dictionary? Well, there happens to be a keys command, right? So it just lists. So in this variable, I can say, what are the keys available? And it says the only key available is menu. So that means I can take the data of uh, the variable and say for that dictionary, what are the keys? Right, and that's where we see the pop up there, right? So that's how we didn't initially know what the contents of this entire data structure were. Like, we a little bit cheated here, right? Because, like, we printed the entire JSON file in order to figure out how to get access to those sub elements. Typically, if you're working with like a terabyte of data in a JSON file, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Printing that to screen is just not going to work. Right, so typically, we have to resort to methods like, what is the type of variable? What are the keys that are available? What are the keys available in that dictionary? Right? So like we have to navigate our way down through the data structure, rather than just visually sort of absorbing it and knowing that that's what's, what's there. OK. Right. All right. So the last of the three data structures I wanted to spend a little bit of time with not too much is uh, XML, so extensible markup language. Again, this is a little bit better than CSV in the sense of you can have a little more complex data structures, just like JSON, but at the cost of having all this sort of mess. Right? So you have to have these element tags, and then you have these attributes, and, and there's just no circumventing the complexity. Right? You do have a really simple data format like CSV, which is hiding the complexity because it's so loose that you can screw it up very easily. Or you get to make the choice of using JSON or XML, 
where there's a little bit more structure, but it's a little bit harder to read. Right? You just can't escape that complexity. All right. So from the jargon perspective, there are elements and there are attributes, but I'm not going to emphasize that too much because there's no well-defined practice about when to use what. So this slide, if you can see it a little bit, uh, hopefully in the back. Can you guys see that? Okay, so these two XML structures contain exactly the same information. They're equivalent. But the way they're laid out is different. So again, remember the exercises we talked about where I asked, like, how do you do grades for a course in a table? And there are like a bunch of different answers. That same flexibility or freedom is available in JSON and XML, where you can basically take the same information represented different ways equivalently. And the challenge is knowing the equivalent. Because it basically boils down to a human to say, oh, this attribute uh, is the same thing as that attribute over there. Right? So it does rely on a human. We have not eliminated humans from data science yet. I don't think we ever will, by the way. OK. So at one point, you might say, well, this is super complicated. And, and why would someone have this so loose? Right? You could do this many different ways, and they're all equivalent. It's because no one wants to be told what to do. Everybody wants that flexibility and freedom when they're solving their problem. But when then someone, else's shows up, someone else's data shows up, and it's not in the format you thought, and you're just like, oh, why is there so much flexibility? Right? So it's just this trade-off again of you want the flexibility, but you want some similarity and consistency, and you can't have both. All right. So last demo, I think, uh, is an uh, XML tutorial. And this is, again, more for your benefit to sort of like, I'm going to give you homeworks that involve JSON and XML later in the semester. So I hope that you remember, oh, back in lecture one, there were some notebooks that had that stuff, right? So you don't have to like freak out and be like, how do I do a JSON? And like, like this is how you do JSON and XML. So again, there's a pattern here, right? The loading libraries, we're reading files, we're parsing the files. Again, this is the library that we're using. And then we're parsing that file. How do I know that this exists? All right, I heard documentation. That's like almost a foreign word to most data scientists. So the fact that class one, you learned the word documentation as the answer, give yourself a round of applause, seriously. I'm like, <laughs> this is a particular word, right? You learned how to solve problems in Python. You haven't even become a Python expert yet. I mean, that's pretty good. All right. So as you might expect, um, the output of this XML structure, if you were paying attention to the slides, it's a little bit more messy. So Python has even more fun parsing it. So that's like the full data structure. Same sort of issue with JSON you will probably not be able to display the entire XML file on your screen when you're parsing a real data set. This is such a small data set, it fits neatly for a class on one slide. How convenient. Mm -hmm. So same idea, you can have nested structures. So this is just to say we have the variable DOC, and then we have these nested sub menus, right? Like, like key value pairs, don't they? It's good there. All right. So it's a little bit different XML, the way that this library parses things into a it's called an ordered dict. That's ordered dictionary. So a dictionary in the Python sense is key value pairs, sets of key value pairs. And I will reemphasize this later, so don't bother memorizing it right now. But key value pairs in a dictionary in Python are unordered unless you're using an ordered dict structure. So just a little comment there. All right. And then, um, yeah, I wrote some of yeah, you can switch back and forth. and JSON files and switch between XML and C, uh, C, uh, dictionaries and JSON. They're all sort of like mungible back and forth. OK. I think that's all I wanted to say. They exist. All right. And I've just shown you three data formats. That is like the tip of the iceberg. Right? All the other data structures are way more complicated. <laughs> so we will not be using most of those complicated data structures in this class. But I just wanted to advertise that they do, in fact, exist. Uh, HDF5 is super handy if you're working with really complicated data. I won't be throwing that at you in this class most of the time. So I won't be putting a lot of HDF5 in your lap. So just be grateful for that. If you're working in like 
on bioinformatics and like places where they have lots of data and they have to keep track of all these different variables like in their data. HDF5 is used pretty widely there. Pickle, that's the thing I use quite a bit for different purposes, but it's a way of taking all of the data that you have in your Python, storing it into a file, and then the next time that you want to like start up your computer and reload all that data back into your Python environment, you just reload the pickle. So it's it's a super handy way of do what's called data serialization. So you're just taking everything in memory, putting it into a file, and then you can load it back in later. So it's pretty handy. If you're doing data science for more than one day, let's say. Right? <laughs> most of the homework, I hope, most of the homeworks that you have here will be done in a short enough cycle where you're not sort of like solving the pickleization problem of like saving state, and that's not the goal of your homework. Okay, so I've talked a lot about all this technical stuff and Python, and maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. That's just like, to me, like less than half of data science. And the other half is the people part. And if you're not a people person, you're gonna be narrowly slotted into a very small problem in data science that someone else has identified for you and that you will solve as a data scientist working on technical problems. But most of the problems we solve, I solve in data science are people problems. Their culture, their process, you know, you have to get an approval to get the data. That's not technical. I can't write a Python script for that. Maybe I can, but. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> this will sound like super weird, but you know, I'll tell you more of these stories throughout the lecture, uh, throughout the class. So, I was giving a presentation on uh, Tuesday to a group that I've been working on a single problem of getting data for five years. Getting data, right? That's not even the analysis part. I haven't applied machine learning. I haven't done visualizations. Just getting the data. Why is it so hard? I'm not moving these bits by hand, right? There is a lot of data, but it, I'm not doing it manually. It's happening automatically. Huh? You don't own the data. I don't own the data. Exactly. So there's four stakeholders I have to negotiate with and get them all to agree. They speak different languages. They're mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, uh, data site owners and customers and data scientists. So like, <laughs> they don't even speak the same language. They definitely don't have the same motives. They don't know why I'm asking these questions. They think I'm there to threaten them or take away their power, right? But I have to prove, I have to like, like demonstrate, like I'm a good person trying to do a good thing. I want to help you do your job more effectively. And all these things, those are not, in a classical sense, like technical data science. You won't find many online posts from data scientists talking about the human aspect. But I'm going to emphasize in this class a lot the human aspect. Okay, if you think that's a waste of your time, too bad you're in 601. So <laughs> that's what I do. So uh, as I mentioned, negotiation, we will do that in this class, right? I want you to walk out of here a, a well-rounded data scientist capable of solving problems. That means solving technical problems and solving people problems, right? What does the customer want to do? Well, you have to talk to them to figure out, how do I talk to a customer? Well, you have to establish that you're not a bad person. Like, you have to identify that you have some skills that are of value, right? All these things factor into solving a data science problem. So I want you to walk out of here with those skills. And I'll be emphasizing that a lot. Oh, yeah, it's not just me, by the way. Like, HBR, if you've heard of them, they do things like that, but not that often. All right. So you're going to work for someone else. Like, that's... Unless you're starting a company and you're solely working, on, wait, if you're starting a company, you're working for someone else. You can't escape, right? This human problem, unless someone else is getting your problems for you, getting your data for you, getting your compute resources for you, solving the problem, giving the product out, like, unless there's that interface, which I just have never seen before, you'll be interacting with people. And so it means talking with them, not just once, but all the time, right? I wrote some code today. What do you think of the results? They're not done, but I just wanted to get your feedback, right? Like that sort of interaction is something that you'll hopefully develop some confidence with. Confidence, what does that have to do with it? It means sharing code that is probably incomplete, incorrect, not what the customer wanted, but still having the confidence to say, is this what you want? You write that iteration process. That takes some, some, some confidence. Right, so often, if people don't have confidence, they wait to be perfect, and then it fails because it is nowhere near what the customer wanted. But that's the other approach. All right. So <laughs> to, to make this a little bit more relevant immediately, 
I'm going to give you this tip. Right? So you're going to be working on your homework, and it's not going to be correct, and it's not going to be complete, and you'll have spent 48 to 96 hours on it, and the deadline's approaching. What do you do? <laughs> no, you don't call a friend. Um, I'm your friend, but you can call me, right? So, um, so what it, my advice to you is uh, uh, try the problem for 30 minutes. At the end of the 30 minutes, stop. Either do something else, switch to some other task, so your brain can go off and like have some cycles to rest, or ask for help from the instructor. That's me. All right, email, phone call, text, however you want to do it. Um, so this is a way of making sure that you get sucked into the problem and just like get stuck and stuck and like you're more and more frustrated and you know the deadline's coming and you're freaking out, right? So start early, ask for help. Don't spend like three hours in a row on a homework problem. Okay. Right. Then there's like how to ask questions. <laughs> I'll be iterating with you over the course of the semester on how to ask good questions because you'll say like, Ben, dear Ben. I ran into a problem on my computer and can't solve the homework. I'll reply back. Thanks for letting me know. What's the problem? Like, <laughs> like, like, and you think like, well, that's obviously comedic, right? No, it's actually what I've seen, right? So, so like, you have to be able to say, here's my notebook. Here's what I tried. This is, didn't work. This is where I looked for help. Now I'm turning to you, right? So there's this whole sequence of how to ask a question so that I just don't point you back to Google, because I'm not afraid to like point you back to Google and say like, hey, have you Googled that? So it's a skill. It's not just, again, not just because I'm an asshole, but because that's how the real world works. Right? If you turn to someone for help, you should invest a little bit and show them the due diligence that you've performed to say, yes, I did try on my own. This is what I tried, <laughs> and it didn't work, so now I need your help. Right? So it's not just as All right. So <laughs> this, is, this is like very personal for me. Like, I'm not a highly emotional person, but data science is very emotional, right? Like, you're excited most of the time, you're frustrated, right? You're confused, you're angry because the customer doesn't even like your visualization. I mean, like, there's lots of boardroom, right? You're waiting around for things to work. Like, there's a lot of emotions, and most of them are negative, I would argue. Like, <laughs> like unless you're looking at your paycheck or, like, you solve a big problem. Like, has anyone here solved a big problem? Hopefully, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. In, in life, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you've solved the problem. And like you feel this rush of excitement, like, woo, I got it, right? Like, there is a big rush from solving a hard problem. The bigger the problem, the bigger the rush, right? How long does that how long does the rush last? Well, you realize that you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I've I've felt maybe like 10, 15 minutes, you get that rush. Right? Then it's back to the grind of like two weeks or a month where it's just like pounding your head into the problem and it's just not working, right? So like, that's the cycle of like, a little bit of insight, some happiness, I got it, okay, back to the grind. So that's, that's your emotional sort of cycle for data science. If you recognize that that's gonna happen, you'll be much more accepting of that's how it is. <laughs> if you think it's gonna be like 24 seven lights flashing, like excitement pumped, good music rolling, like that's not gonna happen. I mean like, I know that. Right. Homework, oh man, already the homework. All right, so this is your first task, get your computer to work, All right? So there's a couple of quizzes that are online. I, those are rated, um, there's some surveys online. I sent the email out, but then didn't realize that Blackboard was locked to you, so I apologize. I think the, the quizzes are due on Friday, if you haven't seen that already. Um, so in addition to that, get your, uh, your Jupyter instance working. This means installing Anaconda, typically. If you have a lot of problems with Anaconda, I do provide technical support. That's not part of UMBC's offering, but that's part of Ben Payne's offering. Right, so there are alternatives. I use Docker. If you haven't heard of Docker, that's totally normal. Um, and if you want to learn more about it, I'm happy to talk about it outside of class. But um, I don't use Anaconda, but I can help you troubleshoot it. Anybody have? Yeah. I have a really stupid question. Good. So what's the relationship between Python and Anaconda, and why do you need to use something like Anaconda? Yes, that is a very, so like we've, we've, <laughs> we've dropped some words, like computer, Anaconda, Python, Jupyter, and like what's the relation? So, so on that, your computer is hardware running an operating system, and it's going to install software. The software is called Anaconda, 
Anaconda is a package manager. So basically, in Anaconda, it provides you this environment where you can click on a thing and get a thing and not have to like go out to the internet. Like it just has all the things. It's like a, a store, basically, but it's on your computer for software. So the value is, once you install Anaconda, it will do all the behind the scenes management. And I'll tell you why that's relevant in a moment. So in Anaconda, that's how you're going to get Jupyter. That's like the thing that we're going to do with in the web interface. So typically, you will not be seeing or interacting with Anaconda. You'll be interacting with the web interface. And that web interface is how you'll put in your commands. And then that web interface, which is Jupyter, will go off and run those commands for you in Python and display the output. So that's the relation between Anaconda, your computer, Python, and Jupyter. I said that Anaconda does package management and behind the scenes management. What does that mean? Remember, we're in Jupyter, we're running Python code, and repeatedly throughout this class, I've shown you that we're using these libraries, right? like CSV, JSON, parser, ePrint, XML, bit, right? All those things, those are packages that would normal, like if you were just like a Ben Payne type person, you'd have to go off to the internet, find that software, <coughs> put it on your computer, install it, integrate it with Python, Make Jupyter aware that Python knows about it. Right? Like, do all that good stuff. Like, I love doing that. That's my job. That's not right. But Anaconda does that for you. It goes off and gets your software for you. It integrates it with Jupyter and Python. So, like, there are Anaconda commands to install the packages, and I will tell you about those later. But basically, it does all that software for you. So, why can't you just code? You absolutely can. So, yes. So, as an alternative to all of this, you could just write bare Python. And I think, yeah, in the next next lecture, the one after, we will do that. We will write in Python. And in Python, there's a couple different ways of interacting with Python. You can do it in a REPL, a read evaluate loop statement. So it's just like an interactive command prompt. Or you can have a Python file, that .py, and you can execute that with the REPL, and then it will make the results for you. So you can do Python alone. But for our purposes, I like to see documentation and visualization and code all wrapped up together. And that's the value of Jupyter. So Jupyter, as a web interface, is a little bit easier to use than the command prompt or a Python script. If you're familiar with those. Okay. Anyone else? This is a very good question. I mean, like, the technology infrastructure of data science typically isn't the focus of data science because you expect someone else to set all that up for you. But often that won't be the case. You'll be a data scientist working at a company, and they'll say, here's a credit card, go buy yourself a computer. And you're like, oh, I don't know how to do that. Right? Like, <laughs> how do I buy a computer? How do I install software on the computer? How do I install an operating system? Like, all these good questions. Right? So like, it's not part of the normal scope of data science, but it's still just expected because you're thought of as a technical person. So if you're not in IT support, it's almost like being in IT support. Right, and then if none of that works, we have this backup of you can do all of your Jupyter stuff online for free. So Google offers what's called Colab. So you can run Jupyter Notebooks through Colab. And then there's other, um, other companies that also offer to run Jupyter Notebooks. But these I see as backups. This is like your primary method. OK. Right. Um, this is a homework assignment. So you'll be reading one of two papers. The one's called 50 of the Data Science, so there's a short history of data science. This is to give you some context. So I've just spit at you two and a half hours worth of Ben Payne's view on data science. I didn't talk anything about the history. I didn't tell you, like, why are we here at this moment and we're not talking about statistics as much? Right? Why are we not talking about computer programming as much? Like, how do those get, how do those get to data science? Right? So for your own education and purposes, uh, I want you to read a little bit about the history and then write a half-page summary of what you've read. That helps me do two things. Identify that you've read the documents or not. And also, how well do you write? Right? If you don't write very well, you will not be able to convey your ideas to stakeholders and customers and your management, write your own sort of promotion papers. Right? So like, writing is a non-trivial skill. I'm not teaching you writing in this class, but I'm at least going to evaluate and say, like, you're good to go. You need some improvement. Get you a little bit of differentiation on that. In this, um, there's a rubric about what I want you to summarize and how to summarize it. The other big thing in the rubric is don't include your name in the paper. Where do we? 
the rubric is in Blackboard. It'll be under assignments. So the rubric says, um, you know, like here's the length, and don't include your name. And I don't remember how many points that is in the rubric, but basically the reason for that is I grade all of your homework assignments without any name association. So they're all anonymous. You submitted them through Blackboard, so Blackboard knows who you are. Then I grade all of them, and then I tell Blackboard, okay, unmask all of the names and the grades, and then like you'll be able to see what grade you got. But for my purposes, I like to remove any bias that I may or may not have. And I want to be able to grade your paper sort of faithfully to what the actual content is, rather than like how much I like the person or whether you've attended class or not, all these good things. So don't include your name in your Jupyter notebooks or your essays or anything else you submit. Questions on that? That's like a little foreign concept, typically. Okay. Uh, right. And then next week, you will need to bring in the thing that you wrote. So you can either bring in your laptop or bring out a printed copy. Bring that, and we'll. Do that in class. Okay, who is reading what? That's the big question, right? So we've got half the class here, 50 years of data science, and then a short history of data science. All right, so I haven't memorized on what side, so it's going to be left to you and your own devices to make sure you read the right thing. I won't know if you swapped accidentally, like. <laughs> okay. Now the thing that's going to freak people out, hopefully. <laughs> A programming assignment. But I haven't taught you how to program yet. How does that work? Ah! <laughs> okay. So if you're not scared, you probably should be, because this is an actual programming assignment that doesn't involve programming necessarily. So I, I got the squinty guys. That's what I was going for. So like, what's going on? Okay. So, <laughs> so this is a description of the syllabus about how I grade the course. Right. So this is like not that surprising. If you read the syllabus, but you didn't have access to it, so never mind. This is the syllabus of how I grade. There's two options. One option is you are a programmer, and you know how to program in Python, and you know how to use Jupyter Notebooks, and you're super bored, and you're like, what is going on? So I'm going to give you this harder assignment, which is write a Python program that does this. Right? If you can do that, cool. If you have no idea what Anaconda, or your computer is, or Python, and you're just freaking out, that's cool. You're going to fall into this camp. How would you do this? Right. So basically, I'm giving you, this, is, this isn't even a question, right? This is like, this is a challenge of thing I have to do. This is a task. And the thing that I'm going to ask you to do is, how do you do it? And if you just like copy paste this back into the text, I'll be like, oh, no, that's not how you do it. <laughs> right. So what am I really asking for? The goal is, how would you break this problem down into pieces that you can solve with a computer? So that means taking sort of like, oh, what are the assumptions? Those are the inputs. What's the thing that I have to do? That's the calculation. What would be the output from this work? That's the result. Right? So even if you don't know how to write the computer code, I'm asking you to decompose this problem into things that you could write as computer code if you know how to do that. That I know that I've mystified some people, but can I get some questions from those folks? All right. yeah. If you're doing Python, yeah. So again, this is a notorious sort of feature of my courses is that I don't specify the inputs or the outputs. So that is left. If you're down in this camp, you get to decide what you think is a reasonable input and output. So. I'm not going to tell you what your skill level is. I'm trying to figure out what that is from what you're doing. Does that make sense? And also, if you didn't read this, two hours limit. So I don't want you to spend an entire week solving this problem. It's not worth it. Right? This is me trying to see how far you can get with this problem in two hours. If you can't make much progress, that's cool. Right? It's just an assignment. There'll be lots of assignments. So I'm trying to gauge where you are at in the, in the space of this, this course. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I actually had a doubt on the previous uh, slide. So, this one? Uh, I'm sorry, what exactly do you mean by rubric for objectives and criteria? Yeah. Okay, so a rubric, so when there's an assignment, the so the input is like, here's the task, read this thing, and like write some essay. And the rubric says, Here's what the score will be on your content if you do these things. So you can think of a rubric as like a checklist of like, put your name on, lose 10 points, right? Like, 
right in half a page, there's 20 points. Right? So the rubric tells you what grade you'd get for doing certain things with respect to the assignment. Good question. Yeah, so the, the trick is if you read this rubric, you'll say, oh, that's what I should do. Right? That's, the checklist is in there, basically. OK, so just out of curiosity, what's, can someone like spitball here with me and say, like, what would be a thing that I want to do to break this from the down? What's, what's like a first thing? Like divide what percentage is given to what and how they use, uh, you know, you give 30% to your assignments, 20% to your projects, or yeah. segregate them. Yeah. And then maybe see how many assignments are there, how many projects are there, and try to. Uh, well, there's 30 assignments and three projects. So it'll be like, uh, I'm going to make up a table for two assignments, give 20% each, and try to make that project different, and assignment do it differently, and try to come up with something. So what would be the output? Someone else? Ah, ah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the output could be either like a number or a letter. Okay. So so I think we have the idea. This whole text here describes like an equation, right? Yeah. So then the then now we have a challenge, right? What is the thing that we're putting in the equation? How would we even do that, right? Like, you're going to give me some notebooks, and I'm going to have to turn that into a thing that goes in an equation? Like, what is going on? Right? That's, to get you started, like, that's where we're going, right? How do we think about this problem? I get a Jupyter notebook. In the end, you get a grade. What happens in between? This is, this is the text that describes what goes on in between, but how would I write a computer program that does that? Okay. Right. <laughs> so, so this is the part where uh, collaboration comes in. So collaboration with me, super cool. I'm pretty responsive on email most of the time within 24 hours. Collaborating with other students, not cool. Like, like talking to your peers, asking, hey, how did you solve this problem? Like it's just social, right? Yeah, but then I can't figure out what you're thinking. I can figure out what you talked about, but I can't figure out what you're thinking. So the whole goal of this assignment, and all assignments, is for me to have some understanding of where you're at in course. If you're not sort of uh, doing the solo work, then I have a harder time doing that. So my goal is to shape the education towards your needs, not your peers' needs. It'll be super tempting to talk about problems, because they're sort of like fun to talk about. It gives you something, you know, you're all in common, but hopefully we can avoid that. Mm, yeah, so you definitely should use the internet. <laughs> like, I just can't prevent you from using the internet. Like, that's a good thing. Um, so you'll definitely want to use internet resources. Those are good things as long as you cite them, right? Again, I want to know what you're thinking, not what Google told you, right? You can use what Google told you as long as you tell me that that's what Google told you. But identifying that this content or idea came from this website, that helps me understand and differentiate where it's you and where it's the resource you're using. So, and, and I don't mean, so like, let's say, I, who here has heard of Stack Overflow? Great. So for the other half of the class, Stack Overflow is a super useful website. And I'll probably put some links into it uh, somewhere in the Pico lectures. But Stack Overflow is a website where people ask questions to the internet, and then other people on the internet answer those questions. And a lot of the Stack Overflow sites are focused around computers, and there's a lot of content on Python. So that's super useful because I'm going to give you homeworks and you're like decompose the problem into a little thing and you're like, wait, I could ask that to Google and then Google will tell you Stack Overflow has also asked this question and here's the answer. That's fine. I'm totally good with that. That's a great thing because you've now leveraged external resources outside of class. That's great. What I would appreciate is if you included the URL to that question in Stack Overflow. But when I say citation, I don't mean I used stackoverflow.com. Well, great. Uh, I don't know what that means. But if you say stackoverflow.com slash blah, 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 that long part, that's the part that shows me specifically what were you trying to learn. Right? Because so this is. We don't need to like formally. No, 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 no. Just the URL. Right? If you're using a textbook, I will commend you. But I mean, most people use the internet. 
All right, so that's sort of my heads up on that. So no external collaboration with other people, either other students in this class or other 601 sections, because there's one of them here at UMBC, another at Trudy Grove. Um, no previous 601 student collaborations, right? Like there's 604 and 605, I don't know, whatever classes. So avoid those students, avoid your peers in this class, come talk to me. I'm super like egotistical, right? I need all of your input. <laughs> all right, that was a joke. Right, so I have, um, this class is not the exhaustive sole source of where you should be in content. There's plenty of news websites, opinion pieces, right? These are like reasonably good websites that I can recommend. I've visited a couple of them actually. Um, and then if you really like people, there are other people who like data science who are not at UMBC. How do I find those people? Meetups, right, exactly. So there's this whole meetup.com website that has people looking for other people with similar interests in your local area. Columbia, Baltimore, uh, DC, it's a long drive, so I'm not gonna recommend that, but it exists. So these meetup groups are places where you can find your social network, uh, collaborators from different projects, right? Learn what is currently going on in data science from other people. Those are all super cool things, and they're typically focused around like somebody talking either about a product or a project they did, Right, and you'll get to see whether what I'm teaching you in class is at all relevant. Because right, I want you to go out and validate. Yeah. That is a lie. I will take that out. If I can get to it. Yes, there is no Slack channel. Good question. So back in the day, we had um, IRQ, chat rooms, AOL, and some Messenger, all that good stuff. So the modern equivalent is called Slack, and it's run through a web browser, and there's a company that makes money off of it. So, not that that's a bad thing, I just think it's Slack. Okay, so people, uh, online sources, and then the last thing I'll show out is the online course environment has a lot of different offerings. And so the advice that I have on that is, you're in this class paying money, presumably the UMBC to spend time with me, so hopefully you show up. But it's not the only offer that exists classes. The online classes, the, the advice I would make there is there's a bunch of them. Many of them are free, and they all have different approaches to data science. So if you look at like each one of them and say, like take the first few classes, and you're like, is this the style of presentation or interactivity that I want? You know, there's so many that you get to choose what your needs are, and then you know, just don't stick with the first one you run into. So like try. Coursera, EDUX, I don't know, what are the other ones? Udacity, Academy, right? Like all these different resources, they take different approaches to the same content, or slightly different content, and so it's on you to figure out which one best suits your needs. All right, has anyone here taken an uh, online course in data science? Which one? But which site? But from Udacity or Coursera or who from? Okay. What was yours? Coursera. And you had one back here? What was it? From Ar Arun? Oh, you didn't. Okay. Yep. So, yeah. So, in this class, you already have people who can you can ask about what was their opinion on the course they took and see if it's worth taking. Okay, I think that's it. So does anyone have any questions before we depart uh, a little early? All right. You're welcome. So the slides will be, go ahead. So the quizzes, there are a couple of quizzes and it's posted on Blackboard. Those are due on Friday. The homeworks will be due on Tuesday, so I have time to grade them and get them back to you. No. I think it's six. I will make it six p.m. Yes. Uh, so in black, I, I don't know if I can. I don't have an assignment posted right now, but um, I'll see if I can. Blackboard. Oh. 
All right, so in Blackboard, if you go into this one course, on the left-hand side, there's an assignments tab. And then under the assignments, it'll have a description of the homework, the rubric, and the place to submit the assignment. So you'll typically be submitting either an essay as like a plain text file or a Jupyter notebook with your code in it. All right. I don't know what a Jupyter notebook is, but I'm sure that that would be clear. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's why I provide text support.